Welcome everyone to our first um, colloquium of the Center for Global Ethics and Politics, first colloquium of the fall and of the academic year. Uh, you may have seen we had one announced, uh, but Sarah Clark Miller had to uh, had to defer her talk until the spring, so we're looking forward to hearing her then. Um, I'm really delighted with to uh, for to have uh, Manon here, um, Garcia, as our speaker. And um, happily enough, um, my colleague uh, from Hunter and the Graduate Center, uh, Linda Alkoff, has agreed to, uh, to um, introduce the speaker and organize things in place. I would like to thank her. And I would also like to thank Patricia um, uh, Cipollini, who has done uh, a lot of organizational work and will also be around helping with the Q&A, which will follow the talk by our distinguished speaker. Um, after the talk and the, um, and the Q&A, there'll be a reception in the Ralph Bunch Institute. Um, and we're gonna keep the Zoom going a little bit to try to have a virtual reception. Uh, since we have here um, about 25 people on Zoom, and uh, we, which definitely outnumbers the people in the audience. Um, so I would also like to take yeah, note of Hugo Barreco who's here, and he's a big uh, um, sponsor and supporter of our center. Um, so with that said, um, I would like to turn this over to uh, Linda, who will introduce our speaker. We're really excited to have this, this talk. Um, it's an important, very important theme, and um, Manon has agreed to relate it a little bit to the international uh, context, which is the frame for the Center for Global Ethics and Politics. Of course, almost anything we discuss is international uh, by its very nature. Uh, but uh, this one especially admits of um, uh, consideration um, that is beyond the United States borders, obviously. So with that said, Linda, please take over and thank you very much uh, to you and to the speaker for coming and for helping out. Thank you, Carol. We're hoping you're feeling better soon. Thanks. Um, and welcome to the talk. We're here today to hear a talk by Manon Garcia, who is a French philosopher, uh, that meaning a philosopher from France rather than that <laughs> category. <laughs> And is now at University of Chicago? No, I'm now in Berlin. Oh, you're in yeah, Berlin. Yeah. Okay, you've moved. So yeah, I've Berlin. moved. Yeah. Okay, we're yeah. in Berlin. So at the Freie University. So okay. In Berlin. Thank you for good. No, no, no. All of her work um, that I know of is on sex and love. Both. Um, and she has some amazing work that's already getting translated into multiple languages. We have copies of this book that you can fight over after the talk, <laughs> but it's it's really brilliant. Um, she has chapters like, is consent a woman's problem? Rape is not sex minus consent, which is an important issue. It's been discussed by a number of feminist philosophers. And of course, saying yes to sex is not like saying yes to a cup of tea, riffing on the well-known um, short video. So uh, join me in welcoming Manon Garcia. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me today. So I'm gonna share my um, uh, PowerPoint so that um, you can have visual cues of what I'm gonna do. Okay, um, so thank you very much, Carol, for inviting me. I'm also um, very, um, moved to be introduced by Linda, as Linda's work has been a very um, important part of my project on sexual ethics. So what I um, want to start with is that I think for uh, many Americans, the idea that um, uh, consent is a, a very important word in discussions about uh, sexual violence against women and about feminism seems uh, probably self-evident, but it it is not as self-evident um, in the rest of the world. And me, um, I guess my work on consent is also informed by this because in France, up until the Me Too movement, 
consent was a vocabulary that was either used in the legal sphere and in the um, uh, political philosophy sphere or in feminism only to talk about um, can women consent to wear a veil, since French people are very interested in <laughs> women in the veil, and um, can women consent to prostitute themselves. And um, it only was me too that there started to be this conversation about sexual consent as it is presented um, here in, in, in the US. And it was particularly striking for me because at the time I was living already in the US and I gave this um, uh, interview in one of the major newspapers in France in October, 2017, I think, in which I talked about affirmative consent. And suddenly this thing got pretty big and people got really upset at me um, about the fact that I was about to ruin uh, the art of love in France and that because of me, people would never have good sex ever again. And that because of me, we would have to sign contracts, et cetera. And, uh, um, and, and it was very surprising for me because I guess I had been living in the US for long enough to have the sort of Antioch College and all the Title IX uh, policies in, in mind. So I, I wasn't even, it was a bit perplexing because I wasn't even aware that I was doing something really uh, controversial by just mentioning it. And uh, one of my mentors at the time, who was a very important um, French philosopher, wrote um, a response that he sent to me for um, to have my feedback before he published it, in which he said that um, in retrospect, had he had to use affirmative consent in his sex life, um, he would have had only masturbation left, probably. <laughs> um, and and I, I remember being uh, pretty puzzled by um, how frank he was about it and how he really didn't see that it was a problem whatsoever. <laughs> um, and um, I think it's also important. So that's also why one of the reasons why I, I put the nine bedeutet nine um, on the slide because I um, have moved to Berlin a year ago um, to take up a position there. And I was very surprised to discover, well, I guess I knew that there had been legal discussions, but I was very surprised to discover that on German campuses, they have a big thing, it's called no means no. And so they're really literally 50 years behind mm -hmm. in terms of discussions about sexual consent. And there's it's unimaginable to have discussions about uh, affirmative consent, et cetera. They're just at the stage where they start introducing consent into the legal uh, discourse, et cetera. And that's something very important because um, in the US, consent is part of the legal definition of rape, but in a lot of other countries, it's not the case, especially, so in France, there's a big discussion about the fact that it's not the case and should it change, but now Sweden has changed it recently, Spain has changed it recently, but it's only recently that it's only since the Me Too movement that has been this big wave of legal changes to introduce consent in the, the fight against sexual violence. And so um, uh, I think it's important to, to kind of uh, take a step uh, on the side from the very American perception that consent has been really part of the discussion on these topics for a very long time. Um, but it's also important to um, remind ourselves that um, consent or the discussion about consent is um, a, a good thing initially, uh, especially when we're uh, feminists, because we sometimes tend, like with, the, with all the, the feminist objections to consent recently, we tend to sometimes forget that prior to the 1980s, society categorized uh, sexual behavior with this uh, normal, abnormal, or normal patholo pathological framework that was stigmatizing any sexual activity that deviated from heterosexual monogamous um, and procreative uh, norms as abnormal. And so both the gay and lesbian movement and the feminist movement have effectively leveraged the idea of consent to dismantle this outdated binary. And so uh, in my book, I'm not going to talk a, a lot about it today, but in my book, I talk a lot about the, the way the gay and lesbian movement used the liberal framework of consent to 
simply depathologize and decriminalize BDSM, etc. And so this is a very important part of the history of sexual consent that we need to keep in mind when we get really annoyed <laughs> with sexual consent as um, I can uh, get annoyed myself. And um, so I, I think um, the problems about sexual consent is like the, the big questions that are raised is first and foremost, this question of has consent ruined sex? So has consent ruined sex, ruined sex on uh, American campuses, but also um, this was kind of the, the idea of the, the infamous uh, Catherine Deneuve op-ed uh, in Le Monde in France of this idea that um, uh, uh, these women wanted to defend uh, a freedom um, of men to bother women. So that that was the, the whole idea of like fighting for, for men's freedom to, to um, effectively sexually harass uh, women. But this, this whole idea of like have we ruined sex came out again in the Wall Street Journal over the summer. Um, so there's this idea that we're um, threatening uh, the joy of sex um, with consent. And, and for me, that was also very interesting because as I, as I mentioned, I was in this, uh, when I started writing this book, I had been living in the US for a while and I was really torn between those two representations or not torn, but, you know, French people think Americans talk about consent because they just don't know how to have sex and how to be good <laughs> at it. And, Fran and Americans think that French people should really think a little bit more about consent <laughs> because what they call sex is very often something very close to rape. And um, it was very interesting for me to try to make sense of those two. Of course, it's cliches, etc. But I don't know. When you watch Emily in Paris, you see that like it's it's embarrassingly not completely irrealistic how she writes, and everyone is talking about sex, and everyone and the entire atmosphere is about sex, and 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 this idea that being French is having sex all the time, and. Um, so, so this is one of the problems that I'm trying to, to uh, look at. And then um, a, a very serious uh, issue that feminists have raised is the question of knowing if um, the concept of consent is really able to address sexual violence. Are we really making any progress in our objection, in, in our fight against sex, sexual violence and the sexual violence committed by men on women uh, and uh, men and non-binary people by using the, the the framework of consent, and then finally um, all the the discussions about sexual consent being a U.S. thing, being maybe the worst of what America has to offer to the world um, by uh, this this development of a sex bureaucracy in which due process would not be uh, um, respected, etc. So. What I want to argue today is that consent can and should be an important tool for sexual emancipation, but not consent as it is usually thought about, especially in the US. Um, and to do that, I want to start with an objection to the com common view on consent uh, by saying that the common view on consent is simplistic and harmful. As Linda was uh, saying earlier, a big um, aspect of the common view on consent is to say that um, rape is sex minus consent. And this is also what you have in the in a, a certain analytic moral philosophy discourse about consent as permission giving. So the, the whole idea of, um, of uh, consent as permission giving is to say, okay, let's think about when we agree to sex, in analogy with when we agree to lending our bike. The idea is that when you agree to lend your bike, what you agree to do, it, what you're doing effectively is to tell someone um, that they can now do what would have otherwise uh, harmed you or wronged you. And the problem is that um, it seems very straightforward that this is what you do when you consent to sex, that you say, well, you can do this thing that would have otherwise wronged me. But I, I hope you can sense that this is actually not what we do when we have sex. That when you have sex with someone, you don't say, do this thing that would be a rape 
but uh, because I say yes, it's not a race. And that's kind of the that that's the main problem, right? With this equation is that it um, uh, provides a vision about what sex is that basically is like it's sex, but you it's rape, but you're okay with it. And it also on the other direction um, uh, presents a, a picture of rape as being very close to uh, what sex is, is like, it's great sex, but you just take off the way that the person agreed. Mm -hmm. And so of course we we rather want to have, or I think we should have a, a an understanding of what consent is that is not um, this equation. Another important aspect of the common view is that we know what consent is and that we know what consenting to sex uh, would be exactly. But that implies that we also know what non-consent is. And the problem is that, is, what is it exactly? Is it um, saying no? Is it struggling frantically? As, as you may know for the, a long time in, in uh, American law, but also in French law, you had to show um, that you fought back. You had to show that you had things under your nails that was the skin of the uh, perpetrator, etc. So is non-consent uh, struggling like this? Is it enough to not say yes? Is it not really being in the mood or need one be strongly opposed? And I think I, I would like you to consider that members of many couples have the experience of not feeling sexual desire at the same time. So when you have sex with your spouse to please them, even though you don't feel like having sex, do you consent to sex? It is probable that the response to this question depends on the details of the scenario. If you're in a relationship that is going well, um, if you're in a relationship where um, that is non-straight or that is not typically very heavily um, heterosexual in the social norms that are respected, maybe that's possible. But on the other hand, how about all these cases where a partner insists on having sex every night and um, even those where even the nights where their partner had an exhausting day or is sick, and all these women who end up saying yes to their husbands because they know that otherwise they're not going to be allowed to sleep, or otherwise they're gonna uh, their husband is not going to talk to them for hours, and it's going to be big drama. And so, is this non -cons is it consent when you don't say anything? Um, and you just go with what your husband is forcing you to do. So I think we need to think about all these cases in their very detail, rather than having the simple understanding that we know what consent is, and it's just agreeing to sex. Another very important aspect of the common view that I think is worth um, uh, fighting is the idea that um, is the idea that it's very linked to consent as a liberal. Um, concept that consent uh, that sex is what happens between two individuals and you consent in this sort of a uh, vat that is completely protected from society and and this is why I think sometimes it's a bit difficult that we try to that it, it's become really cruel to think sex through the prism of um, uh, short BDM some scenes where people negotiate as equals because in most cases in everyday life, you don't negotiate as equals with no stakes as if in a vat when uh, you're having sex. And finally, um, so the last point of the common view is the idea that non-consent is the best way to identify rape, so, so this equation. And so my, so the objections to the common view are first, all the sexist assumptions that are uh, in this common view. So first, this idea that consent is a woman's problem, because um, I um, oh no, I didn't put it on the slide, but I think it's very important to remind ourselves that uh, Alan Wertheimer, Wertheimer, in his very famous Consent to Sexual Relations book that is really the Bible of uh, analytic moral philosophy on consent, um, opens the book in the following way. Although this book uh, ranges more widely, its central organizing question is this, when does a woman give valid consent to sexual relations? And so it is meant to be only women's problem. But the problem is that 
it's meant to be a woman's problem because of very toxic, well, very problematic, um, a, a very problematic set of assumptions. That is what uh, Nicola Gavey called the cultural scaffolding of rape. So um, psychologist Nicola Gavey, very convincingly in my opinion, explains that we have three main ideas that uh, build this scaffolding of rape that allows for rape culture in society. That one is that men always want sex and that it's most of what they care about. Two, that women don't want sex. And three, that sex is heterosexual intercourse of a penis entering a vagina and ending with um, the orgasm of the guy. And of course, we see in this that our, I, like the common idea, uh, the idea of this common view that uh, consent is what women do is, the, is completely grounded on this idea that it's a man who is the man who proposes that sex is always straight, that men necessarily want sex, that asking men if they want sex is like, doesn't make any sense, that women can never initiate sex. So this is a, a, a set of very problematic assumptions. And I think it also conveys this idea that you have in the cultural scaffolding of rape, but that you can have even wider of sex as a battlefield. And as I'll explain later on, this is also why I, I am uncomfortable with this idea of consent as negotiation, because the idea of negotiation is still this idea that ultimately what you want in sex is a sort of selfish maximizing of utility, where um, it was this idea that there's a sort of communicating basis, right? That uh, if you give pleasure to someone, you're gonna have less pleasure that, um, sex is happening in a, a heterosexual scenario where men and women, like men come from Mars, women come from Venus, they have these um, a, a complete um, opposite uh, uh, idea of uh, what they want from each other. And this I think is important because it is a very common point between a lot of cultural, um, different cultural scenarios about what love is because in the in the French scenario that I know very well you don't have so much this sort of negotiation about rape uh, about sorry about sex um but rather this idea that um uh, all this Rousseauist idea that uh women are should uh, um, uh, behave in certain ways to be pure and to be virtuous and they should say no even if they mean yes and uh, they should say no in different ways and so it's always this uh, 18th century idea of sex as a battlefield and um, an important objection to the common view uh, that I detail in the book is uh, Catherine McKinnon's objection which I think uh, is worth um, uh, reminding us uh, is worth, uh, yeah, um, talking about right now. I love this quote where she says, uh, sex women want is never described by them or anyone as consensual. No one says we had a great hot night. She or I or we consent consented. And then this other, um, she's really the best writer there is. Uh, consent is a pathetic standard of equal sex for free people. And so what I'm trying to do in this book is try to take those objections seriously and yet maybe um, defend consent. Then other objections to the common view, as I said earlier, uh, consent misses the social and political dimension of sex. And uh, maybe one of the core um, uh, theses of my book is that consent discourse is missing the fact that consent is first and foremost a moral issue. That we tend to think of consent as a legal question because it's a vocabulary that come initially from the legal world but that what we want from consent is to distinguish between permissible and impermissible sex which is so basically to dis to decide what is right and what is wrong but also and i think this is a, an important question consent can help us think about what is good sex and this is part of what i'm trying to do because i think one of the reasons why we have such a hard time abandoning consent, despite all the feminist objections to the vocabulary of consent, is that we have the intuition that there's something 
more than just the contractual, you want this, I want that, that is happening with consent. And so that's that's what I'm trying to um, defend in the book. And so what I'm trying to do is to think of what and what I want to talk to you, you about today is how can we think about good sex with consent? And my first um, point, but I'm not the only one to, to make it, is that sexual desire is not enough to think about what good sex would be. And I think this is something that I really uh, want to be doing in this book is to go against um, this hypothesis that we need to, um, that, that good sex is, is sex where people love each other and are together for a long time and, and really see eye to eye about uh, their goals in life, et cetera. And rather, I want to think about how we can have good sex while understanding that sometimes we don't have sex based, uh, based on sexual desire and, and that we can have. So that's why I, I put this book from the sociologists, um, Hertz and, and Ken, uh, different sexual projects. And so I'm, I'm reading briefly their quote about what a sexual project is that I find very interesting. So a sexual project encompasses the reasons why anyone might seek a particular sexual interaction or experience. Pleasure is an obvious project, but a sexual project can also be to develop and maintain a relationship. Or it can be a project to not have sex, or to have sex for comfort, or to try to have children, or because sex can advance our position or status within a group or increase the status of groups to which we belong. A sexual project can also be to have a certain, a particular kind of experience, like sex in the library stacks. Sex can be <laughs> the goal rather than a strategy towards another, toward another goal. People don't just have one sexual project, they can have many. Wanting intimacy doesn't mean not wanting other things like to hook up from time to time. And I think this is very important because it's something that, um, in my opinion, seems to sometimes be forgotten about when we talk about what good sex is. Um, and we we tend to forget the fact that we can have many reasons to have sex beside the romantic picture. And so we need to think about what is good sex, not in a sense of satisfying sex, but in the sense of morally, of, of this kind of sex you want to have in the good life. And in the good life, you can have fertility issues and so think about like having sex exactly at those dates every month. And of course, like for uh, those of you who have been in the situation, um, you know that it's not necessarily sex that is based on a very uh, strong sexual desire. You just want to have sex to have kids. And so <laughs> <laughs> I think um, to think about good sex, we need to think about sexual, what sexual subjectivity is. And so there's this uh, fantastic philosopher called Linda, Linda Alcoff that um, uh, says the following, sexual subjectivity involves more than our arousal patterns and our conduct or sexual choices. It also includes a complex constellation of beliefs, perceptions, and emotions that inform our intra-psychic sexual scripts and affect our very capacity for sexual agency. Because our sexual subjectivity is interactive with others and our social environments, it is always in process, changing in relation to our experiences. For this reason, our sexual subjectivities are constitutively or intrinsically vulnerable. And so what I take from this quote, which is maybe not what Linda means by there, but I hope it's, it's close enough, um, is several things. First, that we need to think about our sexual selves outside our, of just the question of arousal. And, and this is particularly important because um, as I discuss in the book, we have models of arousal that are based on the sexual research and the sexual representations about men's arousal. And, and so this is a problem, right? Because there's this whole question of um, uh, what about you know, like it leads to very complicated um, uh, problems about uh, women who have a physical um, manifestation of arousal during rape and who are then told, well, it was probably not rape because you were aroused. And so all these questions of what arousal constitute are also um, 
like male based. So uh, that's one more. But, but more broadly, I think it's um, very important this idea of sexual subjectivity as as Linda develops it because it it shows how our sex lives and our sexual subjectivities as uh, taking part in these sex lives are um, social results. And so I think, uh, so my first book is about the, the problem of women's submission to men. And one of the very common thing that people tell you is to say, oh, these feminists, they're supposedly for sex equality, but in the bedroom, nothing they like as much as having their hair pulled. And so that shows that uh, they're not really feminists or that they like submission, etc. And my response to this has always been to say, well, we live in a world, right? And we're raised in a certain way with gender norms and those gender norms have an, a tremendous impact on um, not only the sexual scripts, but our very capacity for sexual agency. But one uh, aspect of, the, of this quote that I find even more important is the fact that our sexual subjectivities are shaped by our relationships with others. And that um, invites to think about the fact that they evolve over time and that we learn from our sexual subjectivities from exchange, from having sex with other people, from discussing about what we want sexually. And I think one of the very big problems about the way we talk about consent is that it always presumes that we already know what we want, we already know what we like, and our sexual subjectivities are shaped once and for all. And so there's this sort of um, uh, preference model as if our A, our preferences were not adaptive in the broader sense and that they were set once and, and for good. And so this means, as Linda says, that our subjectivities are intrinsically vulnerable, but it also means that we can work on our sexual subjectivities and we can uh, work towards um, shaping them differently. And my other um, influence for, for those of you who know me, it's not gonna be a very big surprise, um, is the way uh, Simone de Beauvoir talks about the erotic experience. Because I think, so the caveat I have about the way she talks about it is that it looks again like this model of good sex as uh, being deeply um, uh, an exchange of people who love each other. But I think this is applicable in a broader uh, framework. So she writes in the second sex, the erotic experience is one that most poignantly reveals to human beings the ambiguity of their condition. They feel there as flesh and as spirit, as the other and as subject. So for those of you who are not familiar with this whole like subject other vocabulary, the idea is that one of the main claims of Beauvoir is that we're essentially ambiguous um, uh, like being a human is being essentially ambiguous and being a subject for ourselves. So uh, the kind of person who says I, etc., and an object for others. And she, instead of having this sort of very um, petrified view of uh, the others are always others, but like objects for me and I am always a subject, she thinks ultimately what it is to live a moral life is to recognize that we're both subjects and objects and to that the problem of oppression is that it petrifies the subject object dichotomy but that we should try to experience ourselves as subject and object and that it means experiencing ourselves as flesh and spirit. A woman experiences this conflict at its most dramatic character because she seizes herself first of all as an object and does not immediately find a confident autonomy in pleasure. She has to reconquer her dignity as transcendent and free subject while assuming her carnal condition. This is a delicate and risky enterprise that often fails. But the very difficulty of her situation protects her from the mystifications by which the male lets himself be duped. He is easily fooled by the fallacious privileges that his aggressive role and the satisfied solitude of the orgasm imply. He hesitates to recognize himself fully as flesh. The woman has a more authentic experience of herself. So I really like this quote because it completely counterbalances what we tend to believe that uh, men have great sex because they feel completely, like, especially in heterosexual sex as subject, uh, subjects, whereas women 
are objects, and so it's kind of uh, complicated, etc. She thinks that this um, patriarchal objectification opens the door for an emancipatory practice of sex where you recognize yourself in your ambiguity and where you're more protected from what she calls the mystifications of masculinity and, and of this, this sort of idea that you don't need the other uh, in sex. And so um, that leads her to think um, of sex as grounded in this reciprocal recognition. So I'm not gonna um, read this quote, but I think um, it is very important because I think this is adaptable to um, friends with benefits and to one night stands and to any sort of sexual encounter we can have. While because I, why? Because I think we can have reciprocal recognition of different degrees. And one of my big concerns with the common view about sex in a lot of uh, conservative discourse, etc., is that it pretends that sex is a sort of outside of uh, human experience where we don't get to be polite. We don't need to be polite. And actually it's probably better if we're not polite. Because of course, like if you're a guy and you're polite with a woman, she's gonna try to trap you and make you Mr. Good, it's, uh, Mr. Right, et cetera. But um, what I think is that you can have different levels of this reciprocal recognition. You can just say like, I recognize you as someone who wants to have casual sex with me. And I'm gonna, I don't know much else about you, but I'm gonna behave in a sort of polite way towards you. But then you can say like, I re recognize you and you recognize me as people who have loved each other for years. And so you have different sets of obligations uh, in, that, in this form of respect um, that you have in reciprocal recognition. And so that leads me to the idea of um, book sex as an erotic conversation. So I need to say here, I hope my um, publisher is not connected, I don't think she is, that I would have never chosen this um, Joy of Sex title. That was not my uh, <laughs> idea. And but that the first option I was offered was um, the sexiness of consent. <laughs> and between the two, I, <laughs> I, was, I preferred the joy of consent. But the, the, this book was first published in French, where he, it was called The Conversation of the Sexes. Because, and I really like the fact that in French, it sounds like the conversation of genders, but also the conversation of the actual uh, like genitalia of people, and I, and I um, like this sort of uh, um, ambiguity. And so my, my idea is to say that sex should be a conversation, but that consent is the conversation that sex is. That it, that, and, and so in order to, to argue this, I, um, I use the etymology of consent that literally means to feel with. And I think that this is something very important. And this is why we have such a hard time giving up on consent is because there is this idea of a, a, a common project um, that happens uh, through sex. And I'm, and, and despite all my uh, respect and admiration for Paul Kukla, I disagree with their idea of consent as negotiation because I think it misses this idea of a, a joint project of a sort of, um, uh, of group agency that you have um, in sex. And that it ultimately um, has a very selfish understanding of what good sex is. And, and, of, and, and I think this is a, a broader question, but I think it might be what is ruining sex more than consent, this sort of um, very uh, closed off understanding of what sex is. That means that you're trying also to limit, to limit risks, even when you wanna take risks, there's this sort of risk is just between me and myself. And, and, and I think that creates this loneliness that we can, we can uh, hear of or experience. Um, and, and that it also leads to this sort of um, a uh, new model against this uh, like uh, men propose and women agree 
model, now you have the, the sort of app model, right? Of we're ultimately um, entering contracts with each other. We discuss, uh, we send each other pictures of our genitalia, et cetera. And so we minimize uh, the exchange actually. We minimize the, the, the shared uh, endeavor. And so against that, I want to understand consent as conversation. I purposely use the concept of conversation for a series of reasons. First, because I think even though affirmative consent doesn't have to be verbal to exist, like affirmative consent is broader than just saying yes, right? Affirmative consent is also showing that you're down, etc. I think there is a virtue of understanding consent as a verbal thing for now. Why? Because it allows to counter this sort of idea that most of sexual violations happen because of a misunderstanding. And so the more you use language, the less you can uh, plead the misunderstanding. But more broadly, I think there is um, an emancipatory use of language in sex that allows to build sexual literacy uh, of how do we talk about sex, not only in our relations to each other, but in the way we think about our own desires. And that the more we use words, the more we find words to use um, socially about what good sex is, what unsatisfying sex is, etc. The more we counter these very gendered scripts and and um, and this possibility, this idea that everything would be grounded on a misunderstanding. And so that's why I think there is an emancipatory power of conversation, not just for this sexual encounter but in a broader temporality of our own history and of uh, society. Because what one of the things that um, Chimis Khan and Jennifer Hirsch show in their, in their book about sexual citizens is that people never have conversations about uh, their sexual projects. Why? Because we're ultimately very uncomfortable <laughs> talking about sex. But this comes from a sexual illiteracy. And so for me, this is always a, um, a joke I make when I'm in France and these conservative people tell me, oh yeah, you're, um, you want to put words when the silence is the best way to experience <laughs> things, etc. I tell French people, listen, you love or we love talking about food. And we really think that talking about food makes experiencing food better. So what would be ultimately different between sex and food that makes it such that if you were to talk about what feels good, what you like, the texture, the this, the that, it would ruin sex. And that a French person would never go to a three Michelin star restaurant alone because you take way less pleasure out of what you eat if you don't talk about what you're eating. And so I think the problem that we have is not having the words to talk about what we like um, sexually. But I also think that this model of conversation allows for an understanding of the temporality of consent. And this is really a, a lesson for me of um, BDSM, that you understand that contrary to this idea that consent is like scanning a QR code and you scan the QR code and you're like on the highway to sex, you know exactly how, like what are gonna be the different steps, et cetera. There is different moments to talk about consent. There's before you have sex, like talking about the kind of sex you wanna have, but there's during sex talking about the different forms of things you wanna be doing when you have sex. And then there's the aftercare and the after sex talking. That is very important. And contrary to what a lot of conservatives think, talking about the fact that sex didn't feel right or that retrospectively you think you didn't consent or you were not liking it, etc., is part of consent. Realizing after an event that it is not what you wanted, you can say like it shouldn't send someone to jail for 20 years, but it's still an important information to disclose and it's an important if information to disclose about ourselves and about, uh, 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 to disclose to ourselves about our sexual uh, subjectivities. And one more thing, what I like about the concept about 
conversation by opposition to dialogue, for instance, is that it really focuses on the fact that you build something that is outside of you. You know, like dialogues, you can have a dialogue between among two people and they just talk past each other. But conversation is really the idea that you collaborate towards something that in a way is both of you to the point that it's not you anymore. And and I I like I, I think it's a very um good model. But the last thing is that I think we know in our life when we think about conversations, that conversations can happen between people who are not equal. And that we have an intuitive understanding of the fact that when conversations happen between people that are not equal, the responsibility is on the person who has more power to create the conditions for the conversation. And so I, what I take myself to be trying to do or to be doing in talking about consent as conversation is to flip the um, consent is a woman's problem issue. I'm saying in most cases of heterosexual sex, consent is a man's issue. And in some other cases, like for instance, if you imagine um, heterosexual sex between a white woman and a black man in America, that would be different. But it is the responsibility of the person in a position of power to counter um, the hierarchies and to create these the, the conditions as much as possible. Of course, it's a it's like we can never pretend that there are no gender norms that women will stop being worried that men are going to rape them if they say no, etc. Like this is not going to happen. But you can create the conditions for a certain um, for the voice of the other to be heard, for the voice of the other to be uttered, even. And so I think we need to focus on the how you on the not only on the hermeneutics of consent, but also on what comes before the hermeneutics of consent of creating the concept, the 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 um, conditions for a good hermeneutics of consent. Um, but I can uh, detail this more in the Q and A. I think we've reached the end of uh, my imparted time. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Hi, Nick. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, I am Obviously, yeah, I mean, there's so much here I want to talk and think about and move our stuff. And obviously, it's really exciting. Um, and I want to think a bit about, I love how you worked in the ambiguity stuff. I think that's such a cool use of it. And I have like two questions. It's like how we can extend kind of your take on the view. Um, so the first is, I'm curious if, Part of the consequence of this ambiguity between you know subject object and also between kind of self and other self and collective, individual and collective right this this ambiguity between oneself as both an individual as, and as part of this broader project if the kind of moral purity politics that accompanies liberal consent politics is one insidious way that 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 one insidious kind of fact that that the um ambiguity would work against, and by that I mean that there might be a way in which one's resistance. This really came up when I was thinking about your use of this oral kind of dimension of consent, right? Uh, where that requires oneself admitting that what one thinks is happening in this moment won't necessarily be what one thinks is happening in, in the future. Right, and really admits that there's this inability to pin down one's kind of moral status as a participant in this like sexual activity, this, this conversation, right? And kind of being okay with that, right? And being okay with the fact that at no one point does one know precisely whether or not one is engaged in the right kind of activity because that's a product, that's something that will develop over time, right? Um, and if one, and, and that just makes me think of this as one kind of dangerous consequence of the liberal consent uh, approach, which like, kind of feels as though it requires you to enter sex so full of your moral righteousness, so sure that, okay, I figured out how to do this, and I'm going to be doing this right, right? And ambiguity might be a cool way to kind of escape. Yeah, so thank you. I think one of the, um, one of the ways in which I'm um, thinking of myself as trying to 
build a bridge between the traditions, even though I don't talk a, a lot about it in the book, is that um, psychoanalysis showed us that we're not transparent to ourselves. And that uh, um, I, I think that's, I, I'm very upset with a lot of uh, ways in which uh, psychoanalysis tried to um, enter our sex lives. But I think this is an important uh, and, and right one that we're not, that, that the liberal model of transparency to ourselves and of knowing exactly, of knowing exactly what we're in for, what we want, what we are, what we desire, et cetera, is, um, it's not a good, it's not a, a, a like aligned with the experience of, of having sex. And so I think ambiguity is a way, is a, um, a way that I find more convincing to think about what's going on without falling into the whole, like, um, uh, you don't know what you want, like, you know. Um, but then I think another problem that you're pointing at is that the liberal model is, um, has over time become a legal model. And so we think that the question of knowing what we consent to is ultimately the question of knowing who goes to jail and for how long. And I think this is a completely um, problematic way <laughs> of asking the question because we need to think first of what does it look like to want to have sex, to have sex, and to have good sex and to have bad sex, and is bad sex just unsatisfying sex or uh, et cetera, before we can decide uh, who gets punished and how and for what. And I think um, consent actually is can be very good to think about um, who gets punished and how and for what, but this should comes next. Uh, and we should start thinking about, because that's how we think about law, right? Like law is ultimately here to, to uh, make legally impermissible things that we deem morally impermissible. And so I, I think the, the thing you're talking about, about feeling uh, uh, very um, sure of your moral stand, standing, et cetera, when you enter sex comes from this idea that you think, well, I asked, or well, I did the affirmative consent, so nothing can be wrong. And the problem actually is that we know that gender norms are such that a lot of women would, and, and even uh, a lot of non-women would say yes to sex they don't want to have. And so it doesn't mean that the people they said yes to should go to jail because like you can't be expected to do much more than to ask the person if they want to have sex with you. But it means that we need to think more about how we can express what we want and what we feel in the moment or afterwards. Thank you so much. Um, so say that you know, what we want from consent is to distinguish permissible and impermissible sex and to say what is good. So I guess I was wondering about how much we should use consent as sex as like in terms of the analysis. So obviously not having consent is bad. Especially with your notion of consent, which is different. But conversation is easier to others. Lots of ways not having that would also be that. Um I think I just are we going to that analyze bad sex entirely in terms of the dirt of consent or yeah, just speak about the relationship between that So I think the reason why, thank you, um, you're, you're pointing at a difficult um, thing for me. The reason why I didn't talk much about bad sex today is I realized that we have this idea, this intuition of bad sex, meaning sex that doesn't feel very good. And so for that reason, I don't talk much about bad sex because I think people get confused. They're like, well, you're you're saying it's okay to have sex for a variety of reasons that are not uh, being aroused, et cetera. And then you say like consent, like when it's not consented, it's bad sex. So how does it work? And so I think, I think you can have fully consented, terribly unsatisfying sex <laughs> and that you actually should because it's by having unsatisfying sex that you learn about uh, what is satisfying sex and what feels good, et cetera. But that 
there is morally bad sex that can be permissible and yet morally bad. And so I think typically, it can, like, this is the case of all of what is called the gray zone, right? Like, if someone has sex, so there is a there is this example that Nikolai Gaby gives of this woman who is the mistress of a guy, and she knows that one of the reasons why he loves her so much is that his wife doesn't have any sex drive anymore, and with her they have fantastic sex and they have a lot of sex. And the problem is that she doesn't really want to have sex a lot of the time, but she feels like I really love this guy and he's going to stop loving me if I don't want to have sex anymore. And so she just says yes and she pretends to be down every time. And so this is a case of permissible but bad sex. I think the guy should be making an effort to inquire a bit more than he clearly does about what she wants and and maybe lowering the, the risks of disclosing the fact that she actually doesn't want to have that much sex, etc. I think you have similar cases of bad sex when you have, in general, harmful gender norms that play a role in the way you interact uh, and, and, and talk about what you want or think about what you want. And I think, for instance, this pressure to be um, the cool girl that is always down to have sex and that is sexually liberated, etc., and therefore can't really say no because that would mean that she's a tease and this whole um, uh, uh, portraiture of herself is actually wrong it can lead to bad sex. It's the, I think it's a, a very um, a common case of bad sex that can happen in gay community where there's this sort of pressure um, to be the one, to be always down to have sex and very sexual. And so it becomes really, um, uh, so it can be that you say yes, but because you feel like you're gonna look like such a loser if you say no, and and that you don't really have the space to not want sex. And so I think this is permissible sex that is bad. So, the idea is that one way that the sex that's constructed, and that's a dyadic we're talking about more dynamic objects being created. Uh, um, you use things such as hierarchy to promote um way that the subject is Thank you. So, so uh, I'll, uh, um, I, I think a, a part of the question, at least, is to uh, point at the fact that the Beauvoir quote is kind of an individualistic quote. Is like, in the, in your life, you can experience reciprocal recognition, and that leads you to having a better sexual agency and understanding your ambiguity, etc. But that. In a way, it seems almost contradictory with all that I've been talking about in terms of gender norms and social norms, or at least it seems oblivious to this. And um, and and then there's a question of what, like, how can sexual agency be built uh, uh, dynamically and not just um, in the in this sort of um, bilateral um, uh, relationship? So I think I think. I'm trying to do both and what I what I like about Beauvoir's version of existentialism is that I think it it allows to um, understand the possibility of a certain individual emancipation and at the same time the impossibility of full emancipation that is not a social uh, emancipation. And so you know like she has the at the well, you don't, it's okay if you don't know, but at the beginning of the conclusion, she says that we can't imagine sexual equality outside of a communist, uh, well, socialist world. So she has this sort of, uh, she talks about all these possibilities and then she's like, well, unless we arrive in a socialist society, none, uh, no full emancipation can happen. And so I do think that um, in the case of, of sex, 
for instance, capitalism has ter has like a, has a very big impact on conceiving ourselves as these sort of isolated individuals that enter contracts, etc. And so I think there are a lot of social, cultural, economic norms that go in the way of uh, that that are in the way of of good sex, and that we need social change. And so I. I and on this in the book that I, I think um, ultimately social movements that allow for, for change and as um, some of us in the room um, probably experienced the, the, the Me Too movement, even if we can think that it's not enough, that it's not full, that it's not this and that, it changed completely how we thought about what we can want, what what we cannot want. Like I think, I don't know if some of you remember the whole Aziz Ansari story. That suddenly, uh, for the I think everyone knows the Aziz Ansari story, right? Like the the this comedian who was accused of having coerced this woman into giving him oral sex. And I remember that there was really a, a sort of generational conflict at the time of a lot of American women being like, this looks like the sex we've always had. <laughs> this may be rape. And then the younger um, women of the Me Too movement saying, no, this is unacceptable. And I remember someone in my family, not about the Aziz Ansari story, but telling me at this time of the Me Too movement, well, okay, but if now we call rape the fact that a guy, uh, I don't know, like would uh, lock the door and say, I'm not going to unlock the door and let you have sex with me. And we were all raped. And I was a bit like, no, <laughs> if you put it that way. And so I think there is a, a, an evolution of understanding of, uh, of sexual norms, etc. And so there is a dynamic uh, change. But it, but I believe, so, so that's where I believe this whole sexual literacy part plays a role, is that we start like starting a conversation about sex, like a social conversation about sex and and this whole thing of, uh, you know, this move towards teaching kids to um, uh, call their body parts by their names, for instance, like this changes things broadly and, and over time. Um, yeah. Well, thanks so much um, for the talk, Marlon. It was, it was fantastic, very interesting. Um, so I have so many questions, but I don't want to like monopolize your time. So I'm going to kind of cut it down a little bit. Um, my research is all about sexual ethics and consent and everything. So it's it's relevant to, to all that. So um, I suppose you said early on that rape is not sex minus consent. And I'm wondering if you think that people can have morally permissible bad sex, what would define rape then? So um, I didn't talk much, thank you um, for, for asking me to clarify. So I didn't talk much about this, but in the book, I uh, also advocate for an understanding of rape that is focused on the rapist and not on the victim. And I think the problem with a lot of definition of rape through consent is that it defines rape through what the victim did or didn't do. And um, so in, in France, there was this very big uh, legal discussion that is still going on because there is no use of the, the term consent in the law. And so the way they define rape is sexual penetration that happens by surprise, um, coercion, threat, and I'm missing one now. Do you remember? No. <laughs> um, force, so maybe? Sorry? Is it force? No, but I think this goes in coercion. Yeah, maybe it's force, yeah. Uh, Suddenly, yeah, I don't know anymore because of the language mix, but anyway, a lot of feminists have been saying no, but we need to have a, a model of consent and, and rape should be defined as non-consented sex. And so some uh, lawyers, some legal theorists say no, but actually 
this is what is being done, but we define non-consent, we precise what non-consent is, which meaning sex by surprise, deception, coercion, etc. But I think more importantly, the way we can um, uh, defend the French law is by saying it's it defines rape by what the rapist does or doesn't do, or what the perpetrator does or doesn't do. And I think the fact, the problem is that we want, so I think there is a strategic question that we want to take, like feminists, rightfully so, took serious, took the, the, the word of rape because the word of rape says, this is really bad. And so it was a way to say, look at how much of the sex is really bad. The women are constantly being raped by men and this is really bad. But the problem is legally, so I understand, so politically it's a good strategy, even though, or politically it's a strategy, let's say, and it has, its flaws is that a lot of people, as we hear today, are saying, no, no, but it can't be rape. Like if there's rape everywhere, then it's not rape anymore. And so there is a problem that is almost like philosophy of language that um, as you broaden the scope of a, of a word, it loses its effect of uh, horror and surprise, etc. And so that's that's a strategic question. Like how much can we broaden the scope of what rape is? You know, like you see how people raise like uh, roll their eyes at Andrea Dworkin and McKinnon and saying look at how they can't be taken seriously. They're saying heterosexual sex is rape. They, they're just saying uh, a BS, you know? And so I think there is this problem of the scope of the, the concept, but that legally, and, and so that's why also I really like uh, Linda's use of violation, because I think the word violation is enough to say, or is, is very powerful in saying, people are violated and you are violated when something you don't want is happening to you sexually. But this should be in a way a different question of knowing if you were raped in the legal sense of being raped. And, and that we can, with the vocabulary of violation, we can recognize that a serious harm was done even when a rape didn't occur. And so that allows also to, so one of the, the, I think the only legal prescription I would give if I were asked what, would be to use something like what they do in Sweden right now, where they have what they call negligent rape. And so the idea of negligent rape is that you get punished for not having done enough to ensure that consent was given to. But I think it should not be called rape. It should be called something like negligent non-consensual sex. So of course it sounds less, uh, uh, but, but and, and when you look at the way they um, adjudicate this category, it's very interesting because there are a lot of cases where they say this person was violated, but this was not the result of active negligence of the person who violated them. And so we want to be able to say, you can be violated, without someone having voluntarily, intentionally violated, violating you. It's, that's like um, unjust sex, isn't it really? Like Anne Cahill's um, idea of unjust sex. Sorry, can you repeat? It's like, um, you know, the concept of like unjust sex, um, it's kind of like that, like in that gray area, isn't it? Between yeah. kind of rape, etc. And then ju I'll just ask one more thing because I don't want to take up too much time. But I was wondering um, when you were saying when you were saying about how it's better if it's a conversation rather than looking at it as a negotiation. Because if it's a negotiation, then it's like people are just out for themselves. But then I was wondering, surely people only come to a negotiation to negotiate about the things that they think the other person might raise an objection to. So I'm not likely to try and negotiate with my partner by saying, oh, I really want to give you a massage or something. 
because that's something that they're unlikely to raise an objection about. The only things I'm really going to negotiate about are the things that they might potentially object to. So I'm wondering if it's like less that I have purely selfish intentions and more that the only things that I need to, the only issues I need to raise are ones that are selfish. Yes, but I think the massage example is important, is useful because actually what negotiation is, is of course you don't negotiate, like, can I give you a massage? But you say, uh, what about I give you a massage and I give you all sex and you give me all sex. And so the negotiation model is a sort of quid pro quo model of sex of what do we do? So I, I think there is this idea of quid pro quo that happens a lot and that is a problem for the for for understanding what sex is that being said i think it's very useful to think of negotiation in the way that quill uh does when they um think about the about sex as invite on the as sorry through the prism of the the invitation model where they say how do we invite people to have dinner with us and how is it different from inviting people to have sex with us? And so what are the mechanisms of refusal, et cetera? But I still think that there is something um, that is more aligned to our intuitions about consent being a path to good sex and about what good sex is when we conceive of consent as conversation rather than negotiation, because you never, like in, in a way, you can um, go back to McKinnon. You never say, oh, what a good sex that we negotiated. You know, like, it sounds like this is really a weird way to think about what we do when we have sex. Dear Belivery Talk, um, I, um, I think you sort of like, touched on this question before, but like, I guess this is just a petition. I was wondering if there's any like, pre-confusion to adopting like your conception of good stuff. So I guess another way to ask that question is, uh, do you think we can approach good sex this way in every single society? I mean, you started your talk by uh, discussing like how consent is understood differently in different societies, uh, in different cultures. I wonder like if um, the same thing applies here. So I, I think, thank you, that's a very good question. Um, so I I have a hard time responding because I, um, I think uh, white Western women explaining what good sex can look like in non-white uh, Western societies can do more harm than um, mm -hmm. good, but, um, what I think is a prerequisite is some form of recognition of humanity. It doesn't mean recognition of equality, but it means recognition of the pos a possible joint project uh, happening through sex. And I think it's not so much a cultural question, but there is an impact of misogyny, and I think there I disagree with Kate Mann in, in some respects, is that misogyny can be dehumanization. And um, that in many cases, um, and, and that historically specifically was this, the, the case that a lot of, uh, when you look at the way sex was being had in the 17th and 18th century, and even in the 19th century, it was just men doing things to these bodies that were next to them. And there, in a lot of cases, there was not even the, the representation as the possibility of a joint activity. So I think this is the main prerequisite. Um, so, so, so first of all, thank you for the great talk. Um, my question is also a little bit about the ambiguity topic, which was partially addressed in an earlier question. Um, I'm kind of interested in your concept of the erotic conversation that you juxtaposed with the paradigm of negotiation. And in this context, you introduced the concept of sexual literacy. And literacy in a broad sense could be 
defined as both understanding and expressing thoughts in, in a written form, right? So I was wondering what hermeneutics underlie your concept of this sexual literacy you're talking about. Is there still this ideal of removing as much ambiguity as possible, even though we acknowledge that there is like this uh, stain of uh, ambiguity left? Or um, should we... Or is like the awareness of this fundamental ambiguity of the interpersonal interaction um, not also kind of an essential part of sexual literacy? And so shouldn't the awareness of our limits of our sexual hermeneutics also be a topic of the erotic conversation that we that it's okay to say, well, I'm not quite sure how I feel about this or that? Yeah, thank you. You're absolutely right um, about the limits, but I think your question comes from the ambiguity of the terms ambiguity or of its uh, uh, uses in the sense that I don't think it's the erotic conversation is ambiguous in the sense of philosophy of language or of uh, that, that um, there could be different meanings of what you're saying or um of a of a hidden meaning or or multiple meanings of what you could be saying actually i think we should strive for as clear as possible even though i agree to some extent with psychoanalysis that we're not going to be able to be completely transparent because we're not transparent to ourselves but um i think i use ambiguity in the bavarian sense of the a, a sort of anthropological character that were uh, uh, both um, like we we both you you could say as we both have an internal sense of who we are and a, um, an external sense that comes from how we're seen by other people um, and and I think this is more uh, this this double self that we have in a certain way um that that is interesting for the erotic conversation than the, the sort of linguistic meaning of um ambiguity uh thank you for this wonderful talk i have too many questions um i'll just mention a few one uh, just to defend the idea of dialogue would be one thing i would want to say although it does suggest that it's between two people which is a limitation um but uh, my question was sort of my main question was kind of asked, which is the um, uh, if you could say a little bit more about the extension of the notion of consent when when the liberal dimension is removed and it becomes more cross cultural. Um, I like your emphasis on um, dehumanization it would be the negative side. What would be the positive uh, correlate? to dehumanization if it's extended um, more globally. I also, I might, it's suggestive to think of the idea of joint activity that you bring into the picture and a kind of conversation about a joint activity. But given the, uh, the extremes that still exist with respect to, for example, femicide, um, dehumanization sounds good to me, but what would be the can you say anything more about the extendability of the notion when in cross-cultural context, maybe in a more uh, also positive way? Um, I like dialogue because it does, it has a history, which is um, also suggests sort of a recognition uh, of the differences of people, of the different perspectives that they can bring into the picture. I guess that's also captured to some degree by the term conversation. Uh, just finally, um, in connection with the extension of this, it would seem important to consider the social conditions, preconditions for effective conversations, if we're going to con concern ourselves with extending it more uh, in different contexts beyond our comfortable ones, which are important ones, but nonetheless. And so I know this is asking too much right now and probably you discuss it in your book and you mentioned something about Simone de Beauvoir's idea of um, you know it being also a social transformation but a little bit more along those lines might also help with this idea of extension extension with differences it doesn't have to be legislating for everybody but 
some idea of what it would look like and um, would be more about that issue would be interesting to hear. Thank you. So um, I'm going to try to respond um, at least partly. I think I'm going to unveil my, my game here. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm doing is very influenced by Kant. Um, but not by the, the um, anti-sex Kant, but by the uh, uh, you can you you can in in a way in a sort of rephrasing of you can use people as means if you also use them if you also consider them as ends. Mm -hmm. And so the the positive version would be respect. I really think, and so I think that's the idea I have with politeness is that. Uh, respect takes uh, multiple forms depending on the degree of interaction that you have with people and the degree of, of uh, connection that you have between people. And I, I think what I want to say, so I have this chapter where I say, well, we have those two sort of competing frameworks of consent, one that is the liberal consent and one that is the very demanding uh, Kantian consent. And where, where consent has to do with autonomy and respect. And I think that's why we're so hooked on consent is because of this Kantian uh, um, sounding term. And what I, I wanna try to be doing is to say um, that the, the bottom sort of legalistic question of what is permissible, what is impermissible, is the same concept of consent as what can be good sex, but in one case is no um, breach, like no um, infringement on your humanity, and the other, like the other direction would be res full respect for your humanity, and that like what we want is forbid sex that is an infringement of your humanity and seek sex uh, that is um, uh, a full respect of your humanity, something like that, um, I think. Um, and But of course, I I think we need to think about the, the as you said, the, the social preconditions for this conversation and that I think we need to be concerned of patriarchy as making those social conditions uh, or uh, of our, uh, or of pre um, preventing those conditions to be met. But I think it's not only patriarchy, I think class plays a role, I think race plays a role, I think ableism plays a role. And so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to have this sort of social, but also so, like social moral model of consent. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Okay, let me ask the last question. <laughs> um, because something occurred to me that I think you might be able to help me with that I didn't do well enough in my book on this topic. And it concerns this question of sex without arousal. And I really appreciate that all of this went on. This is fantastic. Because you take a feminist approach, even though you're complexifying and broadening and you know thinking about um it in ways that don't end up with you know culpability and but you're always taking feminist lens so taking a feminist lens to sex without arousal this is the disagreement i had with ann cahill so ann cahill argued in her book that it's not okay for wives to have sex out of care that's not a good thing or that's not a good thing maybe it's okay but it's not good it's not good sex and i wanted to say i, I want to i like to do multiple projects and this has been a, um, like Sarah Hoagland's book on lesbian ethics years ago, made this critique of the transactional mercantile notion of sex that was uh, manifest in Cosmopolitan magazine <laughs> in the 80s, that we should, you know, it's like count out the orgasms. And um, <laughs> orgasms, and of course, women are going to win that uh, because we have all we're getting it, we'll go there. But um, <laughs> it was kind of mercantile, like, the, you know, sort of um, formulaic um, adding up uh, 
to establish what's okay and what's not harming. And I just, I, I, I don't think that I, I agree with both and that's not quite the right way to do it and having this transact, but a lot of women say the transactional and the mercantile approach is really important for women to finally say, wait, I have needs. So what's a feminist analysis that critique that transactional model? Thank you very much. Yeah, I think um, I, I don't know uh, this book. I'm going to look into it because I, I that's kind of what I have in mind was my um, uh, this comfort was the negotiation model that I think it is something like how many orgasms, etc. And so what we want is on the one hand not count the orgasms, and on the other hand take seriously the fact that when you look at college sex. Men okay. don't reciprocate their oral sex. <laughs> and there is a problem about the non-reciprocation of the oral sex. And so um, I think this is also what happens in um, sex out of care. And this is what I, I tried to talk about was the, the two cases of having sex out of love in a relationship that works well and having sex out of uh love or or not really having the choice with a man that forces you because this is what a wife does and so i think there the question is um so it's it's not a very clear cut answer but it's how much um how much reciprocity can there be in the um, in the care in the broad sense. Mm -hmm. So can it be, so it can also be, I, I wanna, I would like to allow for the fact that you could have this very um, classical model of a heterosexual long-term couple where the guy has a higher sex drive than the woman and where they have sex more than she would want. But in exchange, or, or not in exchange, but his form of caring for her is giving her massages a lot, mm -hmm. and that are not necessarily like sex in the sense of penetrative sex or anything like that, but that the care is also that sex is part of a broader equation of caring for each other. And I think we need to recognize this because this is the reality of a lot of people, and we can't tell older women that are having sex because their husband wants it more than them, but they're like, it makes him happy that they're just victims of patriarchy. <laughs> but we also, like, I, I'm very surprised uh, because I'm gonna disclose a lot of my personal life, but I um, watch a lot of Instagram reels and <laughs> I watch a lot of, parenthood of small kids content um, because I have young kids and this is basically the only thing I can do once they're finally asleep and mm -hmm. my brain doesn't work anymore. And because I watch this content, the algorithm feeds me a lot of marital content of uh, these guys who are like the kids. So there is there is this uh, sort of common reel uh, that takes different forms of like, the kids are finally in bed, look at my husband. And so it's like a slow-mo <laughs> thing of the husband who's like trying to take her clothes off. And so but what it says about the nightmare that it is to be a straight mom of like, when finally your kids go to bed, your husband is like, mm -hmm. now it's my turn, you know? And so we need to be able to address this in terms of the kind of... Um, right to have your own body to yourself for an hour once your kids are in bed and you know and all this narrative that you hear on the on this, like podcast about relationships of she let herself go and when the kids go to bed she has, she's not interested in having sex with me and so we need I, I think we need to think about consent in that realm also of uh of social norms like the impact of social norms but I want to believe that you can have sex out of love with no sexual desire and that it can be okay. Because I think this is part of long-term relationships. And I think it's also part of 
a, a desacralization of sex that is probably important. So an important question for me in the book, and one of the reasons why I think the cup of tea model or the bike model don't work, that I think we live in a world where sex is as a, a different status from all these activities. I remember having a, a, a friend telling me, oh yeah, for me having sex with someone is like going on a hike with them. And no, in the world we live in, it's not the case. You can you can try to desacralize sex as much as you can, as, as much as you want, but we're not in that world, or at least not yet. But probably that a lot of harms that happen with sex have to do with an excessive sacralization of sex. I'm, I'm not, I'm a sort of agnostic about should we completely desacralize sex or not? But in any case, this whole like purity, religious content of sex, etc., is probably bad. And this idea that you can't have sex out of something else than arousal is linked to desacralization. So, yeah, it's <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much.